another day in paradise. That was what the sign said on the outside of a house in the Rockaways that my team helped clean out one week after Hurricane Sandy hit. On the corner of Beach 118th and Rockaway Beach Boulevard, the streets were still covered in inches of sand, and it was gathered into huge mounds on the pavement. People's furniture, pictures, books, Bibles, lives were piled up on the side of the road, sometimes even higher than my head. As my group of five from the more than 30 volunteers who went out from Middle Church that day dragged away garbage, a woman called out to us from her front porch, can you guys help clean out our basement? When we found out what she needed, we went inside and we began to peel off sopping wet layers of what used to be drywall from the concrete and brick that was beneath. As we swept out and cleaned up her dark, cold, wet basement, which was her son's apartment, we learned what else she really needed. She needed to feel validated, to tell her horrific story of devastation, and to have a caring ear listen to it. She needed to feel a broader sense of community. She brewed pots of coffee all day long on her porch, for the many people gathered on that block alone to do what they could to help out after the destruction. For her neighbors, for us, and for all those that were gathered to share their stories, share laughs, and share tears as we took care of one another after something that surely changed thousands of lives, including my own. Two days ago, I had my first experience at Friday Night Live, which is Middle's weekly gathering of teens. Before we ate, I asked if anyone had anything that they wanted to pray about. One of our teens said that she wanted to pray for those still recovering after Hurricane Sandy. Last weekend, Middle sent its third group of volunteers out to the Rockaways to assist in the relief efforts. Her bringing that up again made me realize how important solidarity is. Although most of us here today were not severely impacted by the hurricane, we are still impacted by its ramifications and full of concern and sorrow, thinking of those who are still without heat in this freezing cold weather. So today, I feel moved to talk about standing, marching, listening, and living in solidarity. First, let's start with a little background info on the scripture reading. In the Gospel according to Luke, this passage follows just after Jesus' 40-day temptation in the desert. Jesus emerges from this trying time victorious. Now he is ready to begin his public ministry. And today's reading is his first documented sermon, so to speak. What exactly is Jesus talking about? Let's start out with who Jesus is talking about. The poor, captive, blind, and oppressed people. Jesus' ministry is always related to human need. Yes, there are poor, blind, and oppressed people that we see every day. There are also many others in need. Those who are captive to their addictions, captive to abusive relationships, oppressed by immigration laws, or by not receiving enough government assistance after their homes have been destroyed in order to rebuild a safe, comfortable place to live. Or anyone who in any way may be disenfranchised by their circumstances. Jesus is handed the scroll of Isaiah and chooses to read these sections about bringing good news to the poor proclaiming release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. This is his first real public ministry, and this is the topic that he chooses to cover. From this point forward in Jesus' life, it serves as his mission statement. But how does it affect me? I'm not poor. I may feel oppressed sometimes, 
but mostly I'm in pretty good standing in society. But there are times I can be a little bit blind. Too often, I think we all can. In fact, I'm sure my place of comfort sometimes leaves me blind to the many ways people can be subjugated. We all realize the big ones, racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, violence. We know we need to stand together in the fight. Just yesterday, Middle Church sent a group out to the March on Washington for gun control. Woo! <laughs> we do amazing things here, and it's such a blessing to be able to play a part in it all. But maybe you can't be out in the cold. Maybe you can't get around easily. Not all of us can march in 15-degree weather. So maybe we hope for progress from afar? No. Mark Twain said, we all want progress, but none of us want to change. There are so many ways people can be disenfranchised that we don't normally think about, though. I'm currently interning as a chaplain at Beth Israel Medical Center as part of the requirements for my ordination. I've spent a couple nights in the hospital myself, and I've been to the emergency room a few times, but I've never experienced an extended stay. Being in the hospital as a chaplain twice a week has made me realize the struggle patients go through. From being fed the hospital's food on its time, to wearing hospital gowns, to not being able to go to the bathroom on their own, to being stuck with needles and taken for test after test after test, to things much worse. Patients in hospitals feel a variety of really strong negative emotions. Infantilized, demoralized, discouraged, imprisoned, afraid. When I began in September, I was lost. I would walk into a room and have no idea what I was doing there. After a few months of experience, I am finally learning that my primary role in the hospital is to affirm human dignity. That's it. I go in, I listen to their pain, I help them to express what is true for them without telling them what's right or what's wrong or what they should feel or what they should think. I walk with them a little way on their journey through their struggle, and I don't stick any needles in them. I don't tell them if they're going to live or die or spend another few days in the hospital. I just offer a caring, listening ear and treat them with love and respect. That's my role there. And again, like in the Rockaways, it has amazed me what just that can do for someone. So let's go back to the very first verse of today's scripture. Jesus has returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. That sounds impressive, doesn't it? The power of the Spirit. Spiritual power can come from battling temptation, and spiritual power can lead us away from temptation. And within the last 40 days before this scripture today, that's exactly what Jesus was dealing with. Being filled with the Spirit does not mean escaping the world, but means an engagement with the world, an engagement in social ministry. And the power of the Spirit is not only for Jesus. He ends with, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is officially declaring his social ministry to the poor, captive, blind, and oppressed. And now it is up to us. Jesus is calling us to work toward fulfilling the needs of the people. We must find power in the spirit to move us to do so. Today. Today can be a moment of change. We each have gifts. What I've been focusing on lately is part of my nature. I'm calm, I'm good at remaining neutral, and those things help me to be a good listener. What gifts do you have that can help bring about God's reign? 
think about it. The biggest temptation facing many of us today is complacency. I see Trish laughing in the back. This is an armadillo. We named her today. Her name is Shelly. And armadillos can be found in many desert-like areas, and they are known for their thick, armor-like shell, hence the name Shelly. So, we don't have any armadillos here in New York, but according to National Geographic, there are about 50 million armadillos living in the United States today. So sadly, about a half a million each year become roadkill. Why? Because they hang out in the middle of the road. <laughs> Their armored protection may feel like a sense of security, but they just hang out in the middle of the road. How about you? Maybe, like me, you think you're protected. Maybe, like Shelly, you think you're protected. Maybe you're not poor. Maybe you're not captive. But maybe you are blind, believing that the middle of the road is the safest place to be. You don't take a stand. You don't use your gifts of the Spirit. You don't want to offend anyone, so you just stay in the middle of the road. And now we have seen an example of the dangers of staying in the middle of the road. If we want progress, we absolutely have to be prepared to do things differently, to move outside of existing paradigms, and sometimes to make a way out of no way. Look at the way Jesus, in our scripture and throughout his ministry, reaches out to include all those whom society and religion have declared outsiders and invites them to gather around God's table of hospitality. Here's a scientific fact for you. Every time we breathe, we take in millions of atoms breathed by the rest of humanity within the last two weeks. We are so connected that right now, we're breathing the same atoms that people from all over the world have breathed, as well as some of the same atoms that people in the Rockaways have breathed, and people in the hospitals have breathed and people on the streets have breathed. The Holy Spirit reminds me of breath, the breath of life at creation, the breath into the dry bones in Ezekiel, Jesus' breath on his disciples after the resurrection. Right now, as I am breathing, I'm thinking about the rest of humanity. I'm thinking about solidarity, I'm thinking about the power of the Spirit entering into my lungs and thinking of ways I can and will use that power. In Phil Collins' music video for Another Day in Paradise, there's a sign on the side of the road that reads, Please don't give to beggars. They cause traffic jams. It's time for us to wake up and realize that if all of humanity is not okay, then we are not okay either. What can I do to change? Together with God and with one another, all things are possible. Don't let it be just another day in paradise. Amen. <laughs>